Welcome to the Swisspreneur Show, a podcast about startup stories and hands-on learnings from experienced entrepreneurs. My name is Sylvan, and I will be your host. Today, we're going to talk to Manuel Granacher. He's a serial entrepreneur and just sold his company Core Systems to SAP for about $150 million. This is one of the biggest startup exits that we have seen in our ecosystem recently. Of course, we're going to talk about this story, but also about his early beginnings, where he started as an apprenticeship, then actually sold the first deals without having a team or anything in place, and how he actually built a successful company around that. We also talk about his first exit, which was Mila, a spin-off out of Core Systems that he eventually sold to Swisscom later on. Overall, a very cool story that we can take a lot away from it to learn, to think about, and also to apply to our own businesses. And as always, you can also find additional content on social media about today's episode. So make sure to follow us on Instagram and Facebook. Before we get started with the episode, I would like to introduce you to SPB Startup. If you think that your company is a good fit for the Swiss Railways, get in touch with them or learn more about their startup programs at spbstartup.com. Manuel, welcome to the Swiss Printer Show. It's a real pleasure to have you here today. Thank you very much. And I would like to start with the huge success story that you wrote last year. You sold your company Core Systems, a software for field service management to SAP for, as media reported, around 150 million Swiss francs. And I want to know, how does it feel to switch your role from being a founder and, and CEO of your own company to become an employee and executive at the huge company like SAP? Right. Yeah, it's a quite interesting journey. I mean, um, you can imagine when we sit together with, with SAP um, and, and, and work on this deal, that exactly this question took me awake in the night um, because it's not only about me, it's also about my team. It's about what you build together. It's not only my, my personal personal um, situation. So I mainly uh, decided also for my team, is this the right, uh, the right direction to go? Um, but, you know, we worked with SAP and, and by the way, I all the time worked together with large partners uh, to become successful. So we already had a very trusted relationship with SAP as a, as a partner over 10 years. Mm -hmm. So I definitely knew how SAP, you know, as SAP or such a large company works. And I saw it really as an opportunity and, and more as an investor kind of, um, because in parallel, we also looked for funding. You know, okay. to, to bring my, my invention with what we worked hard together as a team to a higher scale, right? Um, and, and I mean, SAP is a massive sales organization. We have 15, I don't know exactly, but around 15,000 field sales people. So my, my, uh, my first thought was I need to convince all these 15,000 people to, to sell my product, right? And that was my main motivation uh, to really make that. And, and, um, I'm now here at SAP since a while already, and I can tell you, it is still like an entrepreneur uh, spirit here because uh, we can build our product. Mm -hmm. um, of course, there are some more rules and, 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 and more decision regulations, of course, and, and, and what a large company brings with it, that is normal. But on the other side, what is really cool, we have, you know, we have uh, this massive sales organization on a global scale. We have massive events where you just can walk in and present your product. Right. And that feels still like a startup, honestly, within in this large company. So that's why I feel still very pumped uh, to, to do, you know, and, and, and drive my, my baby forward. So for, from that point of, of view, I I'm, I'm still feel very good and learn a lot, you know, dealing with uh, in, in the situation and SAP is moving from on-prem to cloud. Um, is a massive move and, and for me it's uh, I, I mean I can learn a lot also how to to work in such an environment mm -hmm. and and the last point as a startup um, working in B2B the hardest and the most tough thing was 
building a trust to other large companies, you know, that they buy your product. Right. Because that's also where the big revenue is, I guess. Exactly. Uh, you know, are you here? And the big, biggest problem is a large company, usually they laughed what they do and, yeah, you're a great guy, but, you know, we decided to go with, I don't know, Oracle, SAP, Salesforce, whatever, because, you know, and mainly the problem was because you were too small or you they were not sure if you make the next funding round or are you still here in two years and so on and so on. And of course, SAP over the last 40 years built all the trust to all these large companies. So for, for us at the moment, it's much easier uh, to talk to very large companies, um, even decision makers on these uh, companies. And you can really focus on, on the innovation and, and on the product. Mm-hmm. And all the, about all the, the things about are you still here in two years and are you mature enough? It's gone, right? And that makes it more interesting to focus on 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 the product and on on the innovation itself, right? So that is also what what I see as a benefit, cool. right? When we speak about what what changed in a more challenging way, I would say, of course, it's a large company. We are close to hundred thousand people. There's a lot internals, uh, a lot internal meetings, a lot alignment, a lot um, stuff that you need to be careful that you not become defocused, right? right. But as a startup, you learn over hard learnings that you need to keep focus, otherwise you, you, you will not survive, right? And that, I would say, is the challenge in a large company that you get defocus, right? Mm-hmm. And um, I would say that is really tough. That was much easier as a startup. You, you just said, look, this we do, this we don't do. Right. And that is not easy anymore in a large company because if a large customer of us say, you have to do that, you know, then you're in challenge. So this is the, let's say, the, the challenges. I think that's a great summary. Was an exit always planned? for core systems? Was this no, always your in- t- intention? We never, we never planned exit, right? I mean, this is even, you had no time for that. You no, know, because an exit, in my opinion, is coming out of the blue, in my opinion. This is not so, when you plan an exit, either you want to go out as a person of the business or you have no money or whatever, you know, but plan an exit or you have investors that do that for you. But as an entrepreneur, you never think about an exit you all the time think about the next step of the venture, right? How you make it bigger and how you scale it up, right? And I, I told to my people all the time, I want to become a billion dollar company. I never told them how, but at the moment <laughs> we are a billion dollar company, right? And uh, just through this exit and, um, and, and that was the motivation. And of course we had all the dreams to make an IPO once, right? But for us, it was important when I started this company we want to make a great story. We want to help large companies to move, right? And and that we definitely achieved also with this big move of this exit, right? For me, the exit was the next step of the venture. So for you, this, not, this is not the end of the journey, no. just a step in between, sort of. And, and uh, exactly. And then exit also don't make for the money because uh, the motivation to build this further is, is much more value. Of course, you get a little bit cash for, for what you worked hard and... 80, 90, 100 hours sometimes a week. Uh, that is maybe the, the, kind of the, the, you know, the, the profit for that. But you also worked hard, right? It is not that it's not like you invested in in in, in st- stock options and that uh, exploded. Mm-hmm. Usually, this is because you worked hard. Um, but now the journey goes ahead. Uh, really, how we how we become a billion dollar business within a billion billion dollar company, mm-hmm. and that is interesting. And that, in my opinion, is no difference if you build it standalone and you need funding, right? right? You need hundreds of million funding, or you work in an environment in a large company like SAP or Google or, or any one of those big player, and you have to build it within the organization. You also need to make business case, ask for funding, and so on. It's the same. Same uh, game. It's the same game. You have roles. to bring scale. Yeah. You need to learn how you manage the sales and so on. And, and that's likely similar mm-hmm. i don't say it's easier on an investor side it's easier on a on a on the in, in, inside of sap i do, i would say the the thing what changed i can openly say is if you go with investor you have to deal with many mm-hmm. and you have to convince many to make a round right. so as a ceo you spend more than 50 percent time for such rounds 
in uh, SAP, you have a more focus. You deal with one, let's say, a big one, but with one. And you convince a team, a management team that believes like you. First thing is we make we need to make customer satisfaction. Let's say we customer satisfaction and this and this. So you share the same vision, right? With investors, it's more about the money. It's more about, okay, how you make the profit and so on, right? With within SAP, it's more about how you really, really help the, our customers. So that changed. That makes it a little bit easier that you can focus a little bit more on the business itself than running around for, for funding. Cool. I would say that reduced by at least 50% yeah. of my time. What, what is in, the, and I'm sure I can speak here for all founders, usually funding is 100% job <laughs> and then the CEO is the other 100%. That's why yeah. I would say as an entrepreneur, you just work double, double time. <laughs> you also grew up in a, on the countryside. Mm -hmm. Your parents yeah, were... Yeah, it's like, no, you don't see it, but on, on some hills, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Very close to here. So your parents were also both entrepreneurs, uh, small businesses that they run. And this is a typical Swiss way, sort of, to, you know, to, to work and, and to have your own small business. Right. In what way has this influenced and shaped you also for your entrepreneurial career. Yeah, I mean, I mean, we. I grew up in a, I would say, farm kind of style in outside three three kilometers from from you know from from the village. Um, in a very nice environment as a kid, you loved it, right? And I just saw a newspaper in the newspaper that there this article goes around that kids need forty five minutes to walk to the kindergarten. I had an hour. <laughs> Um, so, of course, the, the, the thing I learned um, is, is a tough environment always, right? When you do a business, we had a, a small car carpenter, uh, wood craft uh, business and um, very service oriented, by the way, you know, so customer mm -hmm. first, right? So, and, and this is, I guess, what you learn from the day one, right? The customer is, is it's all about the customer, right? If you not make the customer happy, you not, you not, not make money at all, right? And the entire family is dependent on, on, on these single customers. Mm -hmm. I guess this is the impression you get when you grew up, when you grew up in a very small business, you really value the customer, right? And that you make a super service, that you get money for it as a, as a small, as a small company. And I guess that I still have in me, in, in my, in, in my heart, right? That, that every customer, we, doesn't matter how large and small, I, I, I definitely would say I'm a person customer first. That's it. How does that show in practice? Like, what do you do at core systems to, to really put the customers first? <clears throat> so it's, it is, first of all, how you work with your team, right? That they understand because they not grew up that way, right? And um, so first thing I learned to do with the team is make the values around that. Um, give you an example. We had five values at, at core systems, um, you know, like the typical ones, like think big, get things done, um, show integrity every day was another one, um, make awesome products, of course, these kind of standards, one, right? Mm -hmm. I would not say standards, but that and modern software companies, somehow you will find them right. a similar way. And one is respect, loyalty, loyal customers, because that, that was my most important thing. This was one value when I saw, let's say, a ticket ticket tra trail about a customer that is unsatisfied. All the time I was able to speak with the team and say, hey, take care of these customers. Make that, that, that. And then just hashtag respect loyal, loyal customers. So it's a communication thing also, right? So build around values. And um, that, I think, is, is crucial. Because otherwise, when the company is growing, you will join, join, people will join, they not have this experience. They not understand that customer first is important. They may mm -hmm. think code is more important than customer or, you know, other stuff. Sure. And, and that's very critical because otherwise the customer feels like a ticket. I'm a ticket number, right, in this company. And um, I'm sure you know it from other companies. To feel uh, as a ticket number is not cool. And this customer experience um, is all about value. And these values you need to build, these core values you need to build from, from day one. Mm -hmm. And another story also we did um, is our, how we build our branding around it. Um, so we had this 
core moments, it was our branding, you know, and the core moments, what we said with that is, you know, the main mission we have, why we do this software is to make these small, super cool moments in the, in, in, in the field of our, of our customers, right? So these cool moments, you can do a different way. You can do it with your software, but you can also do it with a cool um, support call. So you can build, you can make these moments, these cool moments where the customer feels very satisfied. And so we build that in in our entire uh, be belief story or I would say motto of the company. And I, I would say that I transformed from, from my experience as a, as a child in, uh, growing up in a small company um, through tools, I would say, into the company. Because otherwise you cannot manage it. Yeah, I think that's a very nice story to also show sort of the Swiss values, what you can take exactly. away from them and implement that in your company. And especially if you are in a software business, like we are in a SaaS cloud business, mm -hmm. it's not about one-time deals, right? It's all about keeping the customer satisfied and, and happy that he will not churn away because we live in a subscription-based model. Sure. You know, also this company where I now in the leadership, we started on-prem. So you sell a big 10 million deal and then you let the customer go. If the project gets successful or not, Maybe it's even not so much in your responsibility mm -hmm. because you have partners. But now as a cloud company, every single day, you are the service provider. So if your cloud is not running or, you know, or something is, your, t your support is not smooth, customer will turn away. They will go Absolutely. to competitors because they're not did any more a 10 million upfront investment. Maybe they just pay on, a, on, on the go. So to turn away is also not so costly because in large software deals usually you, you you already paid the 10 million so that means you need to get the project to success but if you pay on the go you change you're sort of also under more pressure because when you build the house right if yeah. you build the house and even some stuff goes wrong you, you still to try to fix it even costs more if you rent something and you are not satisfied you just rent something else you move yeah you move Absolutely. right and i guess you can really make this uh, comparison right mm -hmm. You also launched your career, I would say the typical Swiss way. You did an apprenticeship, then you yeah. studied computer science at the University of Applied Science. Exactly, yeah. In what way has this way of getting your education with also a very practical focus helped you in your entrepreneurial career? Right, I mean, I am a super fan of this dual, I don't know if it's called dual model or so, but that I would say this is one of the per perfect model we have here in Switzerland. And I see both, both kind of companies, by the way, in the software industry. I see these kind of companies, they only hire these ETH super PhD guys, right? And our way was mixed, right? We, have, we had both. We had these people from the applied uh, university, uh, FH way, and, uh, and from ETH, and let's say the, you know, that only goes through the, let's say, the, the, the learning curve was only through schools. But I think the mix is really very important, especially when you are close to customers. Mm -hmm. I mean, we need the super engineers uh, for these algorithms and so on. But if you're very, I'm, I'm honest here, when you're very <laughs> close to customers, sometimes you also need the guys that I would say are the kind of the Swiss farmer guys, you know, yeah. that are uh, st straight and, you know, not, not bullshit talking, say, look, this we can do, this we cannot do, right? They're not not do too much engineering, right? Um, this kind of, um, I don't know the English word, but this Boden Shandy kind, right? And down some, to earth, probably. Down, down to earth, right? And I, I think the success is then the mix, you know, because sometimes uh, just the crazy engineering, of course you can solve everything, but the problem is can, can you do it in time and in, 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 in money, right? Yeah. And, um, and I have the feeling sometimes, you know, in, in, when you worked in, uh, in, in, I worked at Studer Revox. And in that time when, we were, when I worked at Studer Revox in my, during my education, on the first day I remember very well, Studer Revox was uh, on a crisis and we, we, we fired 800 people. That was my wow. first day. <laughs> welcome so, to the company. <laughs> welcome to the company. And, you know, but I learned so much. In the four years, I learned so much how the company went through different uh, transitions, right? I mean, when you only go into universities, you, you don't see that. Yeah. How old were you then? Probably 16 years old. Yeah, right. I don't remember exactly, but yeah. So when you start, yeah. 
And then uh, after that, that was for me as the four year as a uh, there was a I was I did you know I did everything like built uh, CPU uh, platines and and all the stuff. So I really learned a lot on on the job. But I also learned and, and software coding and all the stuff you learn. But the other half you also learned how how a company works. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that is also education. And I would say. Mix this together is the success. Absolutely. I think this is a very great takeaway for the Swiss model. How right. you can exactly. you know, use it as a benefit for an entrepreneurial career as well. Exactly. When you started Core Systems, you were at the, the University of Applied Science. You right. started as a sole proprietorship. Right. Why and how did you start? I mean, you started that sort of as a, as a side project besides studying, right? Exactly. I mean, I, it's not a side project. It was because I needed the money to study. So it is that way. I started to make a um, software project. Back then, it was just simply to make money. We had no vision, right? I, I started this company with a friend. Um, I did software. He was a more electrician um, kind of, and we went to companies and then helped them with their digital I would say today digital transformation, but back then we just needed we just needed work, sure. and we did everything. I mean, software, web pages, commerce, and what I started to do is I was very kind of good in convincing customers, and then I hired uh, students to develop it. Right, so I had some time up to fifteen students from the university okay. to to work for me, and then of course I had a little bit uh, much in to to my customers. So this is how I ramped at the company. And um, I also had some tough talks with my professors. Um, what I want now, should uh, do you want to study or do you want to make a business? Because I, I was all the time, I made my, 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 my credits, but the, I guess the guys that worked for me sometimes struggled a little bit to make their, to make their um, grades. And, um, and of course, I got some, I got some problem during my, my university st uh, stay. But... We fixed it, and um, after uh, we had our diploma, right? Uh, we right away started. I mean, on the day one, I would say five or six students from that group worked for me. We we started, and um, and back then, I mean, I promised them to pay salary in a more, let's say in, in, in with a certain uplift. Mm -hmm. And I remember we, this was the first year we already needed to make a one million revenue, right? I mean, that was for me already big. So the pressure was on. Yeah, and we had no investors at that time. So we really bootstrapped it. We had uh, everything comes in from customers, right? And and uh, through the first, yeah, through the first year was all through revenue by customer projects uh, or the first two years even. Mm -hmm. And then we find the way how we built products that we, by the way, SAP was my first largest customer mm -hmm. exactly in this building, in this room. I was able to make the first deal with SAP. It was a 250k deal. I remember it was my largest first deal, more or less in the first week after the I had my diploma for SAP. And uh, I can say that here, um, compliant. I was not hired then by SAP, so we sold that project to SAP, 250k, uh, and and with you know with a delivery list, what you all need to do. That was a product back then for for the Swiss market. And we sold it. And when I left the building here, I started to call people to hire. That is the way, right? As <laughs> call read the people, say, hey, I have a project. I need you. I can pay you. No, this kind of way. Right. And then I hired another five people that we were able to deliver or overnight. Right? So you basically, you sold something. You knew how to build it, but you didn't have the people on the team yet. And then you sort of figured out how that, to actually that, deliver it. That was it. the first way. The other way then later on was I hired the people... I knew I not have the money to pay, but that is when you go after investors. So, but in the beginning, I started to have sold the project and knew I not have the people, but I trust my network because I just jumped out for the university and some took some boring opportunities. I'm sure I was able to win them back to, to work for a cool startup. Mm -hmm. And the greatest story I like to tell and never forget, it was my, I would say, fifth employee, uh, Philip. Um, I knew him through well my network. I was one of these guys I called when I drove back from here from Regensdorf to, to Windisch. 
I told him, hey, I have a great project. I need you. I, I would like to have you an interview. Come to, to my office, right? And or, that, by the way, the office was at my home in, in a three and a half room uh, uh, apartment. And, <clears throat> and he was coming around eight o'clock in the evening. And it was, it was my door with two big bags. And then I, I was wondering if he bring me some wine or what he wants to do. I mean, I was surprised. And then, anyway, we started to talk and then I asked him what is in, in the bags. And then he said, it's my monitor and my computer. And I asked him why and say, if you hire me, I can start right now. And it was <laughs> eight o'clock in the evening. And the day start, ended uh, four four o'clock in the morning or so, you know, that, that, that was that was the spirit. biggest experience, yeah. you know, he, he just, <laughs> he bring his computer with him. That's a pretty just cool. Just to start, yeah. right? I mean, that is a true story. And um, that, I, I mean, that I never had in an interview, right? We, we should test that if, if that still works, if you bring your computer and say, I, I don't can know, work I right don't know, away. but <laughs> that was a true story. And uh, he started to code um, through the night, right? And... Um, but I, I think this really shows the spirit that you had back then. I mean, exactly. I mean, this is normal. We were like five or ten people, and we had the first big order, and we we just and it was the largest company to work for, right? So you see, the entire story started with SAP and ends with SAP. So that's a very nice circle, sort of. And we delivered, and just to round it up, and again, it's another true story. We needed to deliver on a date that was fixed, right? And on that date, what was uh, very special on that date. SAP invited all their partner, I would say 25 partners in a big room where we presented the outcome of the software. And the night before, the software was not working. That was not working. I mean, not working. It was done, but we had problems. We had challenges to, to fulfill. In the morning, and we worked the entire night through. And in the morning at 8 o'clock, the software still, I would say, had some issues. We were not able to compare compile it and and that back then it was still burning on a cd and bring it with you it was not like download from somewhere and and uh, and the way when i drove from Vinish to here the software was still not working and the guys told me just make this partner somehow happy the first hour because we still need to finish it and i was there influencing the partners what we did and on on on, on the slides and on, on talk and just waiting that the door is open, uh, get is opening, and my developers walking in. And an, an hour later, the door is opening, and they say, "Thumbs up!" So the software was finished. And I will say, "And now you get, get the software. Let's install it." You know, that was true. Very smooth, but Very smooth. nobody. We had only three months. I mean, this was right. all in three months, right? But I would say that was the. We never forget. Uh, that was that was remarkable. This is always also what people always see. You know. What you see from the inside and what people see from right. the outside, there's a huge difference. That's usually. a huge difference, yeah. And again, we worked through nights. I mean, that was crazy. We slept in cars. It's all true. Just we not had time to go home. The pressure was high, right? And, and I thought, and I think all these people, by the way, are still around in this ecosystem. You know, we, we found those people that worked so hard and worked maybe much more than others. And not for money, by the way, just for the passion. Um, and of course, you cannot do this over f f through five, ten years. But and in the first moment of the company, the first I would say twelve month, that is key. That is key. It's about the people that do this, right? It's not about me or the investors. It's about these developers or or whatever consultants or IT guys that that give this extra mile. Mm -hmm. And why I'm scared to do this again now? I mean, back then we were all twenty something, right? Um, I think the age is also uh, sometimes an impact, right? You, you, and and you, you know, you, you. With, now I learned so much what can go wrong, and this sometimes is a little bit the problem when you start a company because back then we had no clue. If you have no clue what could go wrong, you just do it, right? Now you already start to think, oh, here risk, here risk. Man. That's why I believe when you make a startup after you have a career, likely it will fail because you are not take the risk anymore, right? But, they, but back then, you know, we signed the contract, risk analysis was very small, right? This was like, in my head, like, can I hire the people or not? Hmm, I, likely I can, you know, so this kind of decision. Yeah. And today you make risk analysis and swap analysis, can you do it? 
then at a certain point, you also created a compelling vision. In an interview, you it's, once said, yeah, exactly. you want to be the Google of the service industry. It, 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 it developed, right? It is really true. We not um, founded the company by having a vision. I would say we founded the company by the vision we want to build the company. Okay, we want to build a software enterprise company. That was clear. Mm -hmm. But um, we want to build something for customers in, in, in this domain. That is, was clear. But we not have a clear, we had not a clear product vision. That's true. We were very uh, defocused in the beginning, just to make money. But of course, in our heart, we wanted to build a great brand, core systems back then. Uh, we had the labels on our cars and we were proud, there were t-shirts and so on. I mean, this was clear, but yes, we had this kind of discussion, all the time the discussion, and we wanted to grow 30, 50% year over year, but we needed to develop uh, the product uh, vision, right? And that, that was happening uh, together with the customer, I would say. So more and more with customer inputs, we, we knew we need to go in this direction. So we started in on-prem, but then we learned okay, the, the new world is all in cloud. So the, the first step we did is we, we, we started to develop all our products in the cloud. We were, we were one of the first mover. I mean, I, I'm sure if we would be a Silicon Valley company back then and had a little bit more funding, maybe we, we were able to be, become a little bit bigger. But out of Switzerland, I guess we were, we were one of the first cloud enterprise vendor with all the top and down or uh, flops we had with cloud developing. Um, and we were one of the first Amazon AWS software um, cool. developer team here in Switzerland, where still the server was only in, in US. And that were also very challenging because nobody wanted to host in, in US. And AWS back then were very slow to open a, a hosting center here in Europe. And then Ireland was coming and then Frankfurt. That helped a lot. But in the beginning it was all US, so we also had to struggle. But we decided to build everything on AWS back then. So we had no server in-house. And and then sold connectors to our customers to bring the data to our cloud and then build the software on the cloud. And it was cool. And we had a full focus from sales to service and this kind of stuff. But then we realized that it was also too broad and with the time we really saw a nice opportunity in the service industries because especially in Europe, and we had a strong focus on Germany as an example, there are all these hidden champion companies mm -hmm. uh, where we may not know by the brand, but they are in, let's say, somewhere in the chain of a product. They are, they are the main company to do a product, right? Um, and we, we met those companies and we saw they have thousands of field people uh, maintaining these machines and these assets. And, and yeah, we fall in love with that, um, that we can help these companies to deliver a much better service, right? And, and with mobile that comes up, and then we, we put this together in a suite. And that was, um, that was our first real product still today. And then at a certain point, you also realize that you need an international brand and millions of users, basically. Right. Something that is pretty hard to build up or to find in, in Switzerland. How did you then tackle this challenge? You realized that you need this in order to build a, a big and successful company. How did you then tackle this? What, what were the steps and what led you to this, to this, this conclusion, basically? So what was clear from the day one that we cannot do our own go-to-market, right? That's why we partnered with companies like SAP from the day one. So we knew we need a, we call that channel, right? So we need a partner ecosystem to scale because we not had enough cash to, to build a sales force, let's say, right? And um, that was one of the ways, not only, but that was one of the way, and I would say success, where we were able to scale up internationally, right? We had then built our own offices in US, in Brazil, I was in China, lived there also. I mean, this was really cool. We had our own, let's say, hubs, and it was excited, but then we, through these hubs, we managed partner and the partner in the end implemented our software and sold our software and we give, we, 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 they had a commission on it, right? So, or, or a revenue share model, these kind of referral programs, right? And, and that helped us to scale, right? And then that is how we started the business, especially to get into the mid-sized mid businesses, SME and mid-sized businesses, small and mid-sized businesses. And then on a certain time, 
we started then try to get into Fortune 500 companies directly again because we had already a certain size and of course all the time when we did our pitch we were maybe 150 people but of course we had thousands of people through our partners so in fact we were a large ecosystem right and that's why we were able to go to large companies and convince them say look our software is um, enterprise proven and I guess that was the toughest game because when you go after Fortune 5000 companies, mm -hmm. the deal cycle will become very large, very, very large. And like how long? Sometime ye a year. Okay. And it's costly because you make proof of concept. They don't want to pay. You need, you know, you need to take care of these customers. You need a pre-sales team. You need... So the deal costs exploded. And on small deals, you can make many, many, many in parallel. But on large deals, you can only do a few. So when you do you focus on three when two are lost you only have one left right. so you get very nervous right and that was also a critical phase on our company side but it was really like this you have we had three two way two fall away and then you have the the last one and then back then this was in our case was Alstom Alstom power right mm -hmm. big one that time and that was one of our first large companies we won and then Another one, another one, and, and then sometimes you get this kind of boom, right? And um, then we were really able to to close uh, even very large companies like Siemens and others, right? And I'm sure this also helped then uh, on the interest of SAP on, sure. on our company. But the first one is the hardest one, or the first two, three are the hardest one. How did you decide on which companies you should focus? Because if you only have like three that you can focus on, and two of them are lost during the process, right. you need to make sure that you're betting on the right horses, right? Right. You need, yeah, I mean, one part is that you need a buying center that you have the feeling you can convince. Mm -hmm. You need impact also to the management um, by having a vision in place that they feel like why they should go with you, not what you have. Because they, you know, when you talk to a CEO, it's not about the product. It's about where you want to go with your company. And if this vision you do as an entrepreneur meets the vision they have in that in that topic, right, service. Like we, we started to develop so-called joint visions with, with our customers back then. And that in the end helped to be different to the competitors, to the large companies, right? Because they were not so agile. And that was a little bit then the feeling if you have a talk to a C-level person and you have the feeling he buys in into your vision, then you know, okay, that's safe. And then you need to convince the IT team that they feel like your product is proven. And when you see these different steps and you, you picture this and you feel like good, then you focus, right? But you have if you have this buying center, I call that, not under control, you go out because you're not winning. You just have no chance to win against Oracle, SAP or others back then sure. as a small, tiny company. So it's all about this buying center and uh, how you can influence the different stakeholders. And you have in this buying center, you have people, they are 100% against you and you have promoters. And then you need to, to, to manage them that the, either the promoters convince the guys that are against your software or you do it, but you need to get this under control. Otherwise, you don't make the deal. Because these deal makers, uh, the deal making in large companies are eight to 10 people, right? And this, you need to get under control. So it's very relationship based. It's relationship, it's trust building. It is a vision, again, sell a vision, not a product. Mm -hmm that they believe in the vision too, to transform the company or to change something in the company. And then it's possible to do, but uh, they never buy just your product. Cool. Yeah. Something we have not talked about yet is your spin-off that you created at eight years after you launched Core Systems mm -hmm. called Mila, and right. which you successfully sold to Swisscom. Why did you decide to start a spin-off out of your own company? Yes, so Mila is, is still, I really love that and um, uh, follow the development now on the Swiss, Swisscom roofs. Mm -hmm. um, so what we wanted to, to try out with this um, startup back then or this joint venture was the early joint venture with Swisscom was early, early investor in this anyway, is not only building software, also testing new business models, right? new, no, something that I strongly believe with software, you might improve stuff, but you have a limit. You may improve 10, 20% what is in a large company a lot, 
you speak about millions, but you cannot scale exponential. I mean, the software not help you there. So you need also to change something on the business model. And back then, Core Systems was a poor, a pure enterprise software vendor. And it was hard to convince. Um, and I knew I want to do something also on the business model, try out by myself. And it was hard to convince, of course, the investors and the board to do this within core systems that already was on high risk with funding and, and so on. So they said, look, it's okay, make a, make a new playground, let's say. And that's why in the end we, we started a spin out or a spin off together with other investors. And Swisscom was one of the early early investors. And the I, main idea still today is how can we empower so-called crowdsourcing or sharing economy? That was the back then the big thing, right? Uber, Airbnb, everyone's popping up. Do you mean this was back a few years, right? Mm -hmm. uh, today it's clear everyone likes Uber and so on. But back then we were we were also very first mover, and the idea was really how can we make a marketplace also in service, in field service, um, and empower normal people to join as a technician, kind of certify and, and join this platform and do services for Swisscom. Because Swisscom has only had only a limited uh, amount of technician. And back then they launched the Swisscom TV, was was a huge uh, product uh, launch and a cool product, use it at home. And, but the Swisscom TV you needed to install, and you may know uh, the TV uh, had a Quox cable from Cablecom next, next, and Swisscom TV you might need to install with wireless, and it was possible to do, but you needed a little bit skill. For people that not had time or not wanted to learn it or not wanted to do it, that was perfect opportunity for them to have uh, someone from the neighborhood that comes over and do this installation. Right, and this is exactly what we did with Mila. So we had the demand from Swisscom for some service requests to do these installations, where the technicians may are either too expensive or not had enough capacity to do. And we matched this demand to people in the neighborhood that we asked to do the job, like an like you would request an Uber driver, right? Mm -hmm. And we matched that, and then. Um, we organized the, the payment and the ratings and everything around. And and that, in my opinion, is still one of the in biggest innovation uh, Swisscom did and we did together. And it's still now under Mila um, uh, in other use. I mean, back then it was more about these telco use cases and today they do, they do much more. Awesome. Also very customer centric. Very customer centric. And every, everyone speaks today about customer experience. And we did also some um research um why customers really loved that service and sometimes even did better ratings between um a, a Swisscom technician and um I would we called that back then Swisscom friends right that was the branding and it was not about the service itself because I'm sure that the Swisscom technician was much better because he has this long time experience right it must be it was more about how you get the service, right? How you book it. Because in Mila, we tried that you go online and you, you request someone, you even see who is coming, and he's coming likely the same day or on a Saturday or in the evening. All that was the experience. So with that, it, I mean that the service itself the, the, the installation itself, even it took a little bit longer, mm -hmm. or the technician was, or the, the guy, the, or the, was, the woman was coming, was not so skilled, it was still okay. Because your experience end to end was better. Absolutely. That's the same like Uber, right? Why I book Uber is it's not because of the drivers and the cars. Even if it's a dirty car, I don't care. It's about how easy I get the service. I'm informed, I see on the map, okay, in five minutes or on, on the app. I get a notification, my driver is here. It's all about that. That is the experience. And I think this is why we now in an, we live in an experience economy, right? And also what we see with Airbnb, and I, look, uh, I use it, is also sometimes you, you know it, you have not a nice place, but you still like Airbnb because 
you were able to say this was not a nice place after you booked it, right? And then for me, it's done. But I would again go to Airbnb because I know I have this experience around it, right? Sure. Um, so I like the the stuff around more than really the apartment. And the, 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 I mean, in my business, let's say for my business, I mean, if I would use it for holidays, maybe something else. But it's all about that around. And this we tested and developed uh, with Mila together, right? And Swisscom was the first customer really developed that now into a, even an own startup. And, and why did you decide to actually sell it to Swisscom? And so not... that was clear from the day one because Swisscom, okay. uh, they took a majority from the day one because for them was a, a strategic, a strategic um, let's say, project. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, it was not clear from day one, but when someone buys the majority or, or, or invests in majority, usually it goes in this direction that mm -hmm. then they take the full ownership. Right. And, um, and that was okay. This is absolutely how I, by the way, recommend to many large company to do the similar way. They should mm -hmm. better than run some internal innovation centers and burn money at hell. I see this every day. Better invest into startups um, and then let the entrepreneurs and the team work and then give a nice exit because they worked hard uh, if the people then give it kind of back to control. Mm -hmm. And this is a model I, I highly can recommend to any large company, but I don't see it so much. I don't know why, maybe compliance or so. But it is the best way in the end to, uh, to get. And, and what is important in my opinion, I saw many projects that large companies even jointly invested full. It's important that the people that do that also invest and also has a benefit when, when then the rest uh, is get exited, you know. What many companies try to do is like a startup with full control and then they hire in the end a CEO or a founder. That yeah, doesn't wrong work. incentives. Wrong incentives, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. But the model per se it works and in, especially in Switzerland, in my opinion, we should do more like that to, to drive innovation. I think that's a very cool message. Yeah, we need to, because otherwise I hear, honestly, I hear that we make funds with 100 millions. It's all nice, but it don't work out if we not also find models how these companies really can uh, can scale up, mm. right? Because otherwise we just burn money. Yeah, and I mean, we have a lot And then people of... go back and work for large companies. Sure, we have a lot of large companies here, so we should take yes. advantage of that. Absolutely, and um, we have very cool companies, but most of them are also in a transition. They need to also reinvent. And the way to reinvent, in service at least, is building startups with entrepreneurs together. I would also like to talk about your future plans. You said that an IPO is your personal goal. So is that something that we can still expect from you? <laughs> I mean, we nev I never know, right? But at the moment, uh, my, fo my full focus goes into, into the project I do here with SAP sure. because it's still massive for me uh, to achieve. As I told you before, I want to become here a billion, a billion, uh, uh, still this billion dollar dream uh, now within SAP. And um, that keeps me full busy over the next years. But um, I, I don't can plan what is in three years plus, right? I mean, this is not possible anyway, um, especially in my business. But at the moment, I'm full steam. And as I mentioned before, where I'm, where is my biggest hurdle a little bit, and I'm really honest here, it's not about me, right? It's about do I find again this kind of hardworking, crazy people that do this with me? This is the problem. It's not I would do it, of course, but do I find them again? This is really critical because I think this is this kind of lifetime, one time in the life opportunity. You know, you study with them, you eat pizza with them, you are getting drunk with them, you know it, right? And you make these kind of crazy things. Today, I don't know, this is really my, this, this can, you cannot plan this. And you can't do it on you your own. You cannot plan it. This can happen, some, you know, somewhere you are together with some people and you just say, shit, we need to do it, you know? And that was back then. This is the kind of, you cannot plan it. You cannot build a business plan and then you think like, let's do it. I mean... Look to all these successful businesses out there. None of them started on paper, right? I mean, all of them started through either they were very lucky and also when you look to the entrepreneurs, they all started 
in very different ways and then they got to that what they have today but I would say none of them started really with a plan and then f find people and then execute it mm -hmm. and I think I mean maybe they are but I don't know at least in my space they, they mainly they started uh, sort of out of a container or garage or in one one apartment uh, one one room apartment with two or three friends right that was usually the case yes. and this you cannot plan this is really not the case and by the way and by us too most of them started around universities in and why did you're in this age and you you know you don't have kids or whatever you don't have this kind of responsibility Absolutely. to someone you go full blow risk you cannot lose anyway i right? mean you don't see the risks anyway right you don't yes, see the risk it. anyway yeah. exactly <laughs> and i think that is the only thing i would be concerned so I would need to go back and study something and then maybe find some people. <laughs> so we might see you back at the university. If you see me back in the university, you may think something is going on, something is cooking. Yeah. People should approach you to become part of your team then. Right. But now we are super proud, the entire team, to work here and, and SAP and get the opportunity to be um, still, I would say it's stand alone, don't get me wrong, but have our baby in the best moment of SAP. Because SAP goes now into the cloud and we are one of the strategic cloud product, even if you are the smallest one um, from a team size, but we play on the, on the top headline of SAP, customer experience, right? And service is the biggest market in the customer experience. It's, you know, the customer experience market is roughly evaluated by 50 billion, five zero billion. That's why all these startups, or so I cannot say startups anymore, but when you look to companies like Salesforce and others, mm -hmm you know, scale so, so fast because the market is so huge. Yeah. And yes, SAP is just starting now, but we are a tanker. If this tanker goes in the right direction, we will speed it up. And, and when you look then break it down, over 20 billion is service, right? Because that is the biggest market. So our product has such a big potential. That's why I still dream about this billion dollar uh, revenue. And Absolutely. this is, I not give up before that. Yeah. Cool. In order to conclude this episode, I would like to get your take on your favorite gadgets. Are there any gadgets or tools that you use yourself on a regular basis that you can recommend? Gadgets? Yeah, I mean, what I really use is more and more is uh, everything what is about voice stuff, Siri. Um, I mean, first I've had a problem to get into. Mm -hmm. But I started to use it more active, um, Alexa, this kind of stuff, especially when I drive um, and changed. Um, it was hard in German, I must say, yeah. but sending test me text messages, uh, you know, by during driving or notes or Slack messages, by the way, this is really cool. <laughs> um, I use, uh, we use Slack internally and, um, you know, everything what you can. So I like chat. That is my communication. I mean, I hate email and I like chat and I'm, I'm truly believe that the chat gets more into voice. I mean, maybe it's already by our kids anyway, but also in business and having this kind of tools like, don't need to be Slack, but I love Slack and the, how you communicate to the, with the people. And why I like it also because you have this kind of, you also manage your entire life in WhatsApp, to be honest, right? I mean... That's how we manage our personal life. That's why I strongly believe you can manage even an entire fortune company the same way because people are used to it. And um, Slack gives you also a way that you can have very fast communication to the people without having this kind of old school management layer of communication. Because if you have this kind of email, you know how it is. You send it to someone, then he forwarded, he forwarded. It comes top down from a CEO, then to leadership management. Then, and the guy, in the end, need to do the job. The only thing what you do is you piss him off to do the job, right? Because he, he see everyone add a little bit. And to be really honest, this guy then say, these are all hats. Out. They anyway not add any value. I have to solve the issue. And with, with, with Slack, as an example, you can make it more in a group chat and directly add it. As I told you before with, hey guys, let's fix this problem. Let's respect the customer loyalty and everyone can see it. Yes. And then they came, you know, you not make this kind of manager first and this kind of stuff. And this breaks all this stuff out, you know, and then the people feel much more engaged to solve the problem than 
or busy with why now all my managers see that I did the wrong job, right? So I think that is one gadget I can I use by myself very, very often and I can recommend also to other CEOs to use. Cool. And the last question for this episode, are there any additional resources like books, blogs, podcasts that you listen to or read on a regular basis that you can recommend? Yeah, I I I I started, you know, I started with that, but somehow I don't know. I'm I'm not a I mean I started all these cool books that they get recommended, you know, the hard the hard things about the hard yeah. things and all this kind of stuff or zero to one. I don't know. I I I sometimes feel like I need to listen to myself, you know, and um and I, I, I le what I do is read some blogs that are spontaneous popping up to me that in that moment I'm interested to, uh, to read. But otherwise, I, I listen and, and try to listen to my, I mean, I listen to the situation, mainly customers and try to ask myself what, what you do and do fast decisions, not to be too much influenced from, you know, how others did it. Um, and um, so far it worked out good because otherwise you you get a little bit blurry you know as more you know met methods to do decisions you don't use your instinct to do decisions and uh, I still believe as long as compliant of course to the decision right away sure. and by the way this is also something I recommend to my leadership is better you do 20 decisions and five wrong than only do five decisions mm -hmm. in a world like we work I mean again it's depends a little bit in which world you 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 work right but in our fast moving world it's important that you do fast decisions and many and develop um, I mean we would call it DevOps in our language and develop um, forms or, or methods that you can fix fast mm -hmm. right and and not make big releases and then you 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 cr you make everything crazy make more small steps is something to when you do something wrong fix it fast because that's also culture and this is also methods you need to develop and um, so I'm you know I can recommend to go in this way I think this is a very good recommendation to end this episode thank you very much thank for you taking guys. the time Aaron. and we wish you many more core moments at thank SAP you. thank you very much Thank you very much for listening to today's episode. If you enjoyed our chat with Manuel, make sure to leave a rating on Apple iTunes. We would highly appreciate your support there and all the comments and also ideas for improvements. Next week, we'll already be back with a new episode. We will be back with an episode with Manuel, but this time we talk about growth and scale. Something that I think a lot of Swiss companies still don't get right. Why that's the case and what they can do about it, Manuel will tell you all about it because he's successfully done it two times. So make sure to tune in again for an all new episode of Swisspreneur next week. <laughs>